say I'm extremely honored to be talking here at Stein uh, among so many great people and great presentations we had uh, a few days. I, I'm really impressed by the by the whole uh, event. So thanks Dr. for for doing this and doing these turntable sessions. That's really great. Uh, I burn for scratching. I really like scratching. I think it sounds good. I don't do it myself because I think it's too hard. I did try, but then it sounded awful, so I quit after maybe one hour. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't DJ in any other way either. Uh, I play the clarinet and guitar, <laughs> but I like scratching. So this uh, whole session will be about scratching, and that's it. So, uh, you already seen uh, in Taku's uh, presentation what scratching is, but I will give you a, a quick repetition about what I'm going to talk about. And uh, I will look at how we can analyze scratch music, how we can use those analysis and that kind of uh, information you get, and also how uh, you should go about describing what you hear. Uh, and I will deal with stuff like this. relates to something like this. Sorry, that's me. Um, this one. <laughs> so you see, I have a quite narrow perspective on things. Uh, but I will talk a bit about uh, some uh, interface uh, things and uh, a project I did with the Reactable uh, people down in Barcelona. So I will come into stuff like this. <laughs> say a few strange words about the musical future of scratching without it being me deciding that. Uh, I am a PhD student at uh, KTH in Stockholm, which is a technical university. And I have a background in musicology, uh, music pedagogy, and uh, recently music technology. My interest, except the ones that are probably quite obvious, is uh, musical interfaces in the use for musical therapy, for instance. 
uh, a therapy with uh, profoundly deaf people, uh, and also computer assisted music learning, uh, for instance, for learning how to play an instrument. There's a picture of Stockholm in the summer. <laughs> uh, we don't have many of those days. So, uh, I won't go very much through this uh, slide because uh, Taco has given a very good uh, background on the scratch things and the DJs. But uh, I would like to stress a few things. And that um, one is that hip hop has to be considered as the most important musical vehicle, if you can call it that, for, for the development of DJs, because it has always been in that uh, certain style that uh, new instrumental techniques have developed and so on. And there is always this uh, mix between old and new technology, uh, old and new sounds, using old sounds with new technology, trying to make old sounds with new technology. It, everything about this, this uh, mix. And also, um, scratching turntablism, uh, hip-hop has kind of demanded a new form of instrumentation since they uh, go away from the standard format of a band backing. They have uh, turntables that are really lousy to produce melodies, for instance, and uh, even not that good always at making rhythms. So the whole, the whole instrumentation had to be totally rethought of. Uh, and speaking of turntablism uh, and the turntable metaphor, I don't see it just as a, a rotating circular disc because the turntable or the scratch metaphor for me is also moving a sound file uh, in time, changing the pitch. So it doesn't necessarily have to be uh, done through a circular uh, interface, but that's just a detail. In many ways, scratching has reached a turning point in terms of uh, popularity. It became extremely popular during the 90s and then it has kind of died off a little bit, I would say. But uh, at the same time, people have really got aware of what it is. And it has made its way into the dictionaries, for instance. And uh, the DJ techniques have evolved so far that I would, uh, I would like to call scratching an instrument. I would like to call beat tracking a different instrument. And therefore, I have a bit of a problem saying that the turntable is one instrument because it can be so much more. Uh, I hope I will come back to that later and say what I mean about it. Uh, I won't go much through this slide either, um, but would like to point out uh, the third point here, the repertoire and tradition that uh, in scratching and DJ music, there is very little uh, of the standard ways of making songs, uh, playing uh, the same kind of melodies. Uh, there is a reference style used in, in scratching and hip-hop, but it's not allowed to copy others, which is uh, uh, the important building brick of uh, other kinds of music especially popular music. So there is no repertoire. Without the repertoire, there is no need for notation. And uh, it will become very much uh, improvised based. And also the DJ techniques will be taught uh, in the oral tradition that uh, you show somebody, try to imitate and then uh, build their own style from that. In terms of research, there hasn't been very much of, well, I wouldn't say significance, but uh, at least there haven't been many researchers going in depth. Uh, Lipit Altaku yeah, is, of course, one of the big names. Sophie Smith from uh, England 
I don't remember which university, did a PhD on turntable uh, composition in turntable teams. And then Beamish, uh, which we saw a video from, uh, the D group. And uh, to Hasta Andersen from uh, Denmark. These are people that have, have at least uh, written in scientific journals and so on. Uh, there have been many books about scratching, DJing, uh, kind of uh, teaching material, but uh, nothing that had made had made an uh, impact in the research world. So, uh, going on to scratch techniques. Um, I will show a lot of videos later, so it won't only be talking to you. Um, there are several ways to analyze scratching, of course, uh, and I have looked into a few of them. Acoustically, you can look at the gestures, you can look at the musical uh, significance, the musical uh, role of scratching, and also you can look at it physiologically if you want to. Uh, for instance, I noticed that uh, when I tried to make DJs play uh, in an angry fashion because we do a lot of emotional expression where I work. If they are to do angry music, they are getting more and more tense. When they're getting tense, the blood pressure in the arm is uh, raise, uh, rising, so they, they will have more blood in the hand, which make the uh, movements faster and so on. So there are a lot of things to, to, to look at. Uh, Turntable notation, I will come a bit back to that, but not much. And then I will show how, at least I have implemented uh, some of the knowledge I have found. And also talking about how to transfer this knowledge to other areas. The nice picture is uh, some typical DJ gestures, but you know how they look, so I will go on. Uh, we have around 100 scratch techniques that are defined, or more, but uh, a lot of them are quite similar, so we can say 100, and that's a nice round number. So. Uh, <coughs> there are a few of them that we could call compulsory. Uh, every DJ that is doing scratching has to know them, otherwise that DJ cannot scratch. It's like uh, walking, running, sitting, the basic... Uh, <laughs> things you have to know. Um, most of those scratches ha have names that uh, are recognized by many DJs, like Baby Scratch, Scribble Scratch, Crab, Twiddle, whatever. Not whatever, that's not Scratch, but uh, all the other ones are. And uh, some of those names are made by the DJ. The, for instance, the Transformer Scratch, was a DJ that th thought it sounded like the Transformer he watched on TV, and so on. Uh, but the definitions of the, of the scratches, they are strictly formalized. Um, I could say that I come up with uh, uh, one technique, for instance, the crab, which I didn't do. That was someone else. But when I say I come up with this scratch, then I tell the world through forums how to perform this scratch. I show a video and I say, okay, to do this scratch, I don't know how to do this. I said that so I can stand there. You have to push the for record forward, backward, while you do something like this with your finger. That is how to do the crab scratch. There's no other way. And that is kind of the definition of that scratch and it's uh, really strict. If you try to do it another way or call a scratch the same as somebody else will call it, it will be a war. <laughs> kind of like making a new application for Linux and calling it uh, Emacs. Um, but most of the techniques are of course only variations of uh, the offset between what you do with the crossfader and what we, you do with the record, because there is only, in my world, with scratching, it's only two things you can do. You can change the pitch in some fashion, maybe you have one push forward and two back, or just forward and backward, 
and you can turn on and off the sound in some pattern. And that's one technique and there's really not much more that you can do with that. But they sum up to around 100 different ones. Um, in a performance, the DJ will not do like baby, scribble, but will do it very fast and in a very complex uh, fashion with a lot of uh, half-performed techniques then bringing in a new technique and so on. Uh, you can listen to one example here. Uh, it could represent one bar of music and there will be, I don't know, five different techniques in this. <laughs> if you want to analyze them, you could find a, a few techniques there. And these techniques are of course used as their building bricks to, to, to build uh, uh, performances that try to express something, otherwise they wouldn't be musicians. Uh, notation. Uh, scratch notation has not been established. Uh, well, this is the most uh, established one, the turntable transcription methodology, but it's not used very much. It should be, because it's very good for, uh, for communicating ideas to, to other musicians, especially the other way around, to communicate ideas from a, mus a musician or composer to a DJ that is going to perform them. But the interest have been lukewarm or something like that. Uh, I don't know if you have seen uh, stuff like this, but on the internet you can search for TTM or turntable transcription methodology and you will see a flash demo of this with uh, how, how it works with the music. It's very interesting. And how is it annotated? And what is the Ah. I wasn't going to talk about it, but I can take a short one. Um, here is the sample represented on the on the uh, y-axis. For instance, you have I don't know what it has said because the font is very small, but maybe it says uh, ah or fresh. So you have um, the record movement in the time and uh, and the distance or angle, if you want. And then those black small dots that you see are uh, the clicks with the, the fader. So one dot is like this. <coughs> those uh, lines on the top are just <coughs> moving the record. <coughs> and that's pretty much how it, how it works. So it's a, a graphical representation of how we should move the record. Yes? How is it uh, temporally uh, organized? Like uh, musical score, it's uh, time-wise. So yeah, the, but how? Um, uh, the grids, I think they can be configured to mean different things, but uh, probably here it's uh, 16 notes. I think. I don't know. I, I didn't look too much into that. Maybe it's 8 notes. Who knows? The one who wrote it, no. Yeah, um, I did something a couple of years ago called Skip Proof, which is uh, a kind of virtual turntable and a technique performance tool. I used, I wanted to build it just to, to take a recording of a DJ and, and uh, try to manipulate how the technique was played, but it it was fun to do this in PD, so I continued to do something that we could perform with without, I mean, I, I would never use it myself because I wouldn't even DJ with normal stuff, but some has tried to play with it and I think it's fun. Um, so I will show a video of it. And uh, it uses what I call the, the skip proof metaphor uh, the skip proof section on the record is where uh, one sound is exactly one rotation long and it's repeated for several minutes. So when you play, and if you use force, I won't do it because it's not my turntable, but if you use force or kick the table, the uh, needle will jump. 
and it won't jump very far, probably. And if you have several minutes of the same sound after each other, then the rec uh, needle will land on the same spot in the sound on the record, so there is not much damage done. You can still continue scratching. And uh, this uh, is a looper that loops exactly 1.8 seconds of sound, nothing more. You can probably make it very easily to load longer samples, but that is not what I wanted. It's a very short looper. And here it is performed with uh, something called radio baton, which is a 3D antenna uh, with a, or it's a receiver with an antenna on the finger. To, to trigger uh, different pre-recorded scratches, but you can also use the gestures uh, of the DJ to, to trigger those. And that allows for a high level control, which I will come back to in the slide about uh, reactable. This is just the implementation of different of these uh, scratches with record and crossfed movement. Uh, so a few points about what this analysis and a study of uh, scratching is good for? Well, there are a few points that are quite obvious, <coughs> but uh, this is one of the few cases we have of uh, a highly skilled two-hand input interface. Um, and also one that uh, really uses ambidextrous practice that you do the same with both hands and you're equally good with both hands. And it, is almost non-existing in any other <coughs> interface that I know of. Piano, uh, hmm? piano? Um, piano is not uh, ambit in that sense. Uh, here you have different tasks that do. Hmm? I'm so interested that um, nobody mentions the percussion thing in the whole discussion about Also, can be yeah. I mean, technically. Technically. Mm. Okay. Yes. Yes, I, I, I agree to a certain degree. Um, well, I, I, I don't know how to how to address that right now, but um, uh, yeah, I, I, I don't like to see scratching as a percussive instrument. I, I like to see it as some. So mix between percussive and melodic. Yeah, but that's percussive also. Too. Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. Anything Percussion, yeah, percussive instruments are so many different things. I mean, if you play drums, if you play um, a mallet percussion, it's um, it's very different. No, I just mean the sense of you rhythmically, primarily rhythmically. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I can uh, hopefully go back to that uh, that later. Um, where? Yeah. Scratching is also um, one of those examples of uh, people learning to a very high degree uh, difficult difficult uh, gestures and, uh, and uh, know how to separate very small kind of gestures into, into a meaningful way. Um, description of scratching and DJ music have, I thought was going to be quite easy. I thought people would know exactly what, uh, for instance, a sad performance is, like this. Clearly, 
really sad. But there's a <laughs> smiley there. You see, I had an experiment with this, and I tried to make people match kind of intended the uh, uh, expression from the DJ and match that, but nah. Uh, <laughs> they thought angry was happy and the sad was angry and so on. So it was really not easy. So we had to think, since we believe that DJs actually can express what they feel through music, <coughs> we wonder if we use the right labels and this is a very classical field of research where you try to use emotion, the basic emotions, sad, happy, angry, uh, maybe solemn, uh, fear, scared, and so on. But we felt that there were some labels that, uh, that, we, that were lacking, so it was hard to describe what, what you actually felt the DJ were playing. So we made a, uh, an experiment, new experiment, that people could label what they hear. And we had uh, some uh, 39, 40 subjects that uh, listened to music and described what they thought. And then we uh, tried to categorize those answers and see what, we, what kind of uh, description people use when they listen to this music. And there were many creative descriptions. I don't know if you see on the right, right hand side, side there, but there are uh, words like uh, spacey, spacious, speaking, uh, slamming, sleepy, sliced, sloppy, slow, small, smart, and so forth. And um, these are words used to describe the scratch music. And there were not many angry, sad, or happy. <laughs> Uh, and that is also a bit of the controversy around using basic emotions, of course. But we analyzed the results and saw that uh, people seem to be using at least some kind of uh, strategy when they describe it. And one is that emotional descriptions are rated by very high, they use it a lot. While musical uh, descriptions, for instance, uh, melodious, uh, rhythmic, uh, fast, slow, things like that were not very much used. Uh, except for one particular example where people really felt it easier to describe the music than the, the emotion, for instance. <coughs> so, uh, we got a new set of labels that we thought we could try to use uh, in further experiments. And those are cocky, cool, agitated, amusing, tense and sad. And these are not written in stone, and <coughs> you have to test to see if they work. If they work, it's very interesting. If they don't, well, we have to think of something else. Uh, but we will, or we did a pilot experiment with uh, some uh, subjects that listened to a few different uh, examples, and they tried to use traditional uh, labels those sad and we happy or the new ones including cool and cocky uh, and amusing and we saw that the new uh, labels we found were actually uh, performing better in, in those situations and that was what we hoped and expected so we will do a bigger experiment now to see that it's really true but there are of course many <laughs> questions and criticism you can have about uh, such labels and for instance what is cool cool is so much difficult uh, different uh, meanings for different people and all those three pictures can possibly call called cool and uh, is there a difference between cool and cocky and so on so there are all these questions that you have to have in mind And also, um, we should uh, we should try to think about if if these labels really reflect something that happens in music, or just as a part of what people experience as hip hop. Moving on, interfaces. Um, there has been uh, very nice talks about mappings and interfaces, so. Uh, I won't go through very much here either. 
Um, nothing, I think. No. Just that uh, giving DJs some high level control over scratching, for instance, or other techniques can make uh, them experience and uh, improvise with their own, uh, their own playing style, uh, which can be very interesting, which we will see in the reactable example now. and this is uh, in line with what Taco has said. Um, well, it is not because I say that nothing much has happened during the <laughs> last 30 years. And uh, when digital uh, solutions came, at least for uh, scratching, I think they didn't come with much new that was usable. They have uh, made things worse in many senses. Uh, for instance, you detach the visual feedback from, from the record and put it on a screen, which is, in my opinion, very bad. And uh, the mechanical action of these <coughs> things here is not at all good compared to, to the uh, vinyl, even though they try to do it with uh, the CD, uh, CD scratchers with vinyl interface and so on. And you introduce latency to a system that has no latency from before. And sound quality has never and um, never been convincing with any of the digital scratching things. Uh, one source of error could be uh, those two pictures you see on the right hand side there where you see what happens to a perfectly good vinyl record after you scratch it for a while then the signal deteriorates uh, and uh, you have introduced noise that is not found in the digital source of course but uh, something that is uh, a trademark of the sound of the DJ and it's a dynamical change uh, the record deteriorates fast so if you have a nice sound first then it will uh, gradually be worse during your performance. So, the reactable. Just send here on time. Yes. Um, I guess most of you know what the reactable is. Yes, no? Uh, it's a collaborative instrument, but most of all, it's an instrument where you have physical objects that you move around and you can map them however you like because uh, reactable works as a physical uh, interface for PD or a tangible if you want. Uh, I'll show a video to, so you can see how it works if you haven't seen it. <laughs> but that was the reactable um, and we wanted to try to uh, make those reactable objects into parts of the whole scratching so one object could for instance be the technique uh, or the movement with the record hand and one object could be the movement of the crossfader hand one object could be the sample for instance uh, so you could be a DJ with the, with the reactable in a very direct way, but with high level control. Uh, and I have a little video that shows the progress. This is a very narrative style video. <coughs> Hope you like it. It's very short. I will show you this video because I like it.
Some might say it's quite limited. <laughs> I have to say I agree. But it was very fun, and it was uh, fun for the DJs to try to interact with their own techniques. Uh, this is another video, if it works, of the... We had one DJ and one reactable player. Uh, and this is the DJ in his first testing run with the, with the objects and tried to explore how you can scratch with it or uh, play with your scratches. <laughs> say they used it very differently than what we expected. Um, we have presented some results of this, so you can read more about it if you're interested. Um, I'm going to round up, but um, some thoughts about the musical future of uh, scratching. I think it has a future as an instrument in itself because it sounds so good. <laughs> And I hope that the DJs will continue scratching in the way they do now. Uh, I really hope that. But I don't think that uh, scratching or the DJ will be the new guitarist, because uh, there is always a place for that guitarist. And uh, this instrument, or scratching as an instrument, has its own boundaries and rules. So I don't think it will take the place of anything else. It has to find where it fits in. And uh, of course it fits in, in hip hop and in experimental music, but it's interesting to see how it can be used also in pop music without it just being the cue in a sample and have that mock sound. Because it's, I think it's a bit lame. Uh, it should be a, it should be used everywhere as a, a solo instrument, I think. Um, It has had a big impact on uh, music industry and uh, other kind of industries in the last few years because it's very new and it's very uh, visual, it's very clear what the DJ do, it's a very expressive way of, of uh, using music. So it has uh, become kind of uh, an icon, I would say. So it has been used in commercials, uh, mostly silly com commercials, but also ones that are uh, actually celebrating the, the culture, like this one. Scratching is very good again, <laughs> which is good because they, they could have used something so much simpler in the terms of, of the music, but uh, they have taken in, uh, I don't remember who that is, it, it's not uh, Rob Swift, but it's one of those guys, and that's, uh, that's good, I think. Um, scratching has become... Uh, so <coughs> typical, you know exactly what it is when you hear it. Mm. And uh, bands like uh, bands like Rage Against the Machine, has, uh, this Tom Morello guitarist, he has uh, used it a lot. And now I <laughs> searched yesterday on the internet and found out uh, that there are uh, videos on uh, YouTube that try to teach how to play that uh, scratch solo he sometimes has. 
And this one is really funny. Uh, I think it's probably a 14-year-old kid or something like that. But, uh, how to scratch with a guitar. <laughs> sound as that is that uh, other instruments like uh, like the guitar here try to imitate but also the style is imitated uh, like in this example it's not a video just sound <laughs> Maybe the only opportunity for that uh, instrument to have a kind of renaissance, I think. <laughs> no, that was that was hard. So sorry. <laughs> Nobody plays that instrument here, no. <laughs> no. Joe's house. Yeah. 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 <laughs> you play that? Yeah, you have. A you can use it now. <laughs> <laughs> you have. <laughs> okay, and. Um, uh, I have one last example, then I'm finished. Um, and it's a bit long because I did not find, I couldn't uh, skip in this in this file. Uh, I can try, but uh, the whole song is so nice, and it will give you some something to look forward to tomorrow because this is uh, from tomorrow's artist. And I played this in a, hip, in a DJ forum, and everybody was totally, totally blown out by the, the scratch in this. So it's about three minutes, but that is needed. <laughs> Pay attention, it's, it's so nicely done, much better than everything I've heard about all those uh, beat, all the beatboxers. I think it's great. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
Yeah, I mean the scratchers they are not, you never would uh, uh, compare them to a synth player or to a bass player because the, the, it's something about this uh, extreme expressibility and the, the, the speed and the virtuosity and everything that is, um, it's very apparent. You, you 
Uh, I mean, if, if the guy that is, or girl, that is scratching is not uh, uh, aiming to be seen, then, uh, then it's, uh, no, it's, it's really a, a cry for help. No. <laughs> you, you really want to be seen, you really want to be in the focus. Uh, and you want to have attention. I, that, that's, yeah, I think that is kind of safe to say, and for most guitarists, the same applies.